This is Mac Voices TV. Welcome to Mac Voices TV. This is the Talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, every time we have had our guest this time on, I've introduced him as a senior director for Drobo. But Mark Fuccio no longer has that title. He's uh, gone on to new adventures, and I'm really happy to have him here to tell us all about it. Mark, welcome back to Mac Voices TV. It's great to have you. Chuck, it's uh, very nice to be here and experimenting and trying to do video instead of our normal audio. Yeah, uh, I, and I thought this was especially a good time for us to do this. Uh, we did some video at Macworld, and since then, uh, you called me and said, hey, I'm, I'm leaving Drobo, and I'm, I'm doing some other things. And I think my one of my first reactions after I got over the shock was, well, let's get on and talk about it, and let's, let's let people know where you are and what you're doing and what part you will continue to play in the, the Mac and the tech community. Uh, but you know, before we do that, Mark, let's let's go back a little bit. When did you first join Drobo? That's a very interesting question. I knew the, the founding CEO uh, Jeff Barrell, and I knew him from about 12 years ago when he you know, first started a company which is now called Blue Arc, which is roughly about the number three supplier of high-end network attached storage systems. It boxes itself for $100,000 or more. So I knew him as he had left uh, and uh, was raising money to uh, form uh, the company to you know, commercialize Drobo. Um, prior to that, I was uh, involved in a startup and had raised some angel seed money and it wasn't really going anywhere. So in June of 2005, uh, after that point, uh, Jeff and his co-founder, uh, Julian Terry, had been funded. You know, I contacted Jeff, you know, gave him some engineering uh, resumes. He said, oh, mate, these look perfect for you. Well, why are you not uh, pursuing them? And I told him that uh, for a variety of reasons, things weren't working out. I was returning uh, unused funds to angel investors. And he said, well, perfect. Let's meet. Maybe you could help me out. So we had breakfast and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, it seemed very interesting to me what he was doing uh, in terms of uh, product and technology. It was something I could actually envision myself uh, using. And we started doing some professional services uh, with the company called, you know, my company, uh, Tactics Sales High Tech Inc. Uh, in July of uh, 2005. Uh, the initial uh, project was to help him and the board of uh, directors answer the question, where should they target in the market? Is there an opportunity to target some sort of soft underbelly of raid, or is there you know, other opportunities from you know, the millions of uh, hard drives with USB or firewire connections that were being uh, sold? So Doug in answered some of those questions, and along the way, you know, I really started to fall in love with uh, the people, the technology, and uh, you know, Jeff had tried a couple times to recruit me in, and uh, sure enough, on uh, December 31st of 05, uh, I joined as employee number nine or something like that. Wow, you really were in on the ground floor. Yes, indeed. We started, and uh, way back in July, I remember the first board meeting, we didn't even have a full-fledged uh, demo. The, you know, some of the accomplishments were just uh, getting uh, you know, sort of development uh, chassis together, you know, external hard drives and cables and just uh, making some of the lights flash in response to, you know, adding or removing drives. And it was very, very, very early, very rough, uh, not the polished products that people see today. Okay, so, and, and I, I know you really believed and still believe in the Drobo product. That's that's obvious, and I think it's been obvious every time you've been on the show or that we've talked, that it's it, it was, obviously it was a job, but also it was a bit of a labor of love. So why step away from that uh, when Drobo seems to be really catching fire and I think becoming a lot more popular as people understand what it, what it brings to the table or to the desktop more accurately? I think uh, the answer is by analogy. It's uh, you know, the time to uh, you know you know get an umbrella is you know on a sunny day, not uh, not when you're uh, out of luck and when it's raining. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit humorous. But uh, one of the things that uh, my career beforehand is I've 
ran a professional service company with a partner for about uh, 12 years. And we were working with all manner of startups. And those were tremendous uh, amounts of fun. Basically, the way to think about it is you have a blank sheet of paper. And you can select if you're using charcoal or acrylic or you know watercolors, and you get to you fill the thing in and create a magnificent work of art. And in uh, the five and a half years I was at Drobo, it went from having that uh, freedom, that blank slate, to right now it's on a you know, very successful run rate. Uh, it looks like they'll do uh, you know 80 million or more this year. So a lot of uh, the freedom you know was. Uh, was was basically a thing of the past. It's uh, basically heads down, grow revenue toward, you know, hope for a liquidity event of uh, some sort. So, you know, I had um, been feeling that, you know, every month my job is looking increasingly like it had uh, the month before, and I was really missing the allure and the draw and attention of startups. So I decided uh, you know, it's time to, uh, to leave. You know, I... Um, Vested uh, every single share of uh, stock that I had, uh, left on great terms, and uh, went off to do something different. Uh, this is not the first time I had done this. I had done something similar about 15 years ago when I had left uh, Silicon Graphics uh, in uh, the mid-90s. So you say you left on good terms. Are you still associated with or, or working with Drobo at all, or is it just a completely clean 100% break? Uh, formally, it's a 100% break, although I still get uh, some calls uh, every now and then you know, for asking some help on, on you know, particular situations or you know, helping uh, make an introduction to uh, somebody or different organizations. Okay, so now you have a little time to put your feet up on the desk, right? Or have you just jumped right into something new? I've jumped into uh, something new. I have uh, two startup clients. Uh, if I could look back and do it all over again, I would have taken a couple of weeks of vacation between uh, you know, leaving Drobo and then uh, starting again because it's taken a while you know, just to clear your head and then uh, you know, just get uh, relaxed and then reestablish sort of the daily rhythms that it, uh, you use to you know, focus your work life and your professional life. Sorry, your work life and uh, your personal life. <laughs> I think that was a Freudian slip, Mark. <laughs> it, it may be. I, I don't ask my wife about that. <laughs> no, 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 I won't go there. Okay, well, so so you're you are now involved in the startup community again in uh, in a in a different kind of way, I guess. That's right. Uh, I, one is a, you know, a little bit uh, a larger company. It's a startup. They have some products in the market and. They're going to be launching uh, some new products, and uh, I'm helping them with that uh, in terms of targeting those, as well as uh, some market development activities to help grow the current products that they have. Uh, the other one is a, a brand new tiny startup. Uh, they just got funded about uh, six weeks ago. So uh, they're starting with a blank sheet of paper and finally have office space and you know, payroll so that they can you know, pay employees and uh, they can figure out where the bathroom is and where to get coffee. <laughs> That's important. That's important. Mark, you know, when you told me you were working with startups, I thought this would be a really interesting conversation to have with you. There are so many things right now with the iPad uh, the catching fire or it has caught fire. We, we all have heard so much about the Kickstarter projects that have led to a variety of products, uh, iPad, iPhone, and, and Mac related even. Mm -hmm. So you are, you are in that environment. You have some experience in that environment. Can you give us some ideas of, of things for listeners or viewers that might be thinking about getting involved in the tech community? starting up on a small scale or a large scale. I'd imagine that there are a lot of similarities between the two. There are obviously some differences, but uh, what are some things that, that folks should look out for or think about if they're, if they're about to get into this and try to bring a product to market? I would say the first key thing is really make sure that uh, you have a solution to a problem that somebody will spend money to fix. Because if, if you can do that, uh, then ultimately you have a business. And then depending on the nature of the business, maybe it's appropriate for Kickstarter, maybe it's appropriate for venture capital funding, or you just uh, mortgage your house and uh, you dive in and do it yourself. So the funding is uh, one element of thinking about a company. But really the key issue is you know, making sure that you solve a problem and people recognize it's a problem, they'll spend money to fix it. Because if they're not going to do that, 
then there's no compelling reason that uh, they would buy from you or somebody else who has a similar idea or solution that may compete with you. Okay, that sounds like an awful lot of common sense, but sometimes that's uh, that common sense gets lost in the business world. Uh, and and so, all right, I'm going to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Is that do, have I figured out my market? If I've if I've identified the problem, or do I have to? It, how do I want to say it? I guess. Do you perceive the the market to be a subset of people with that problem? So, if you look at a typical you know startup, you know, the way it uh, founds, the 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 founder or the founding team have uh, some data and they have a good intuitive feel about you know, a set of problems that may exist in the market. And typically they you develop you know, some sort of way to try to you know, focus and solve it. But the problem with that is at some point it's limited by their network of uh, connections, you know, 10, 20, 50, some number of people like that. And ultimately to build a successful ongoing business, especially something that's attractive you know, to be uh, funded by a venture capital, you need to have a large market and uh, the ability to grow you know, very rapidly, you know, targeting that market. So part of it is making a transition from understanding what the particular pain is to being able to extrapolate and measure are there different market segments, you know, different buyers that you know, have that pain that you'll be able to you know, target and communicate to and get them starting to buy into purchase. So that's really why I keep saying it's all about uh, the customer pain and uh, the problem that you solve. Uh, because if you spend any time around sales guys, you know, there's this old saying, no pain, no sale. Well, that's uh, something that can scale up you know, for a company. Uh, if, you, if there's no pain, you really have no business. Yeah. And, and again, it sounds so simple, but it's surprising how many people sitting in, in their basement or their garage or their living room, they get so wrapped up in an idea, they fall in love with it, and they really don't look around and try to decide whether it, it can be marketed. And if there are people that, as you said, have a problem and, and will spend some money to fix it. Right. Some of it is really being able to make that transition from uh, your own experience to somehow develop the type of abstractions where you can think about you know, a much broader uh, market or you know, what people call a market segment of buyers who have similar needs, who learn and you know, act and you know, spend in similar fashions. And it uh, really takes a, a bit of a challenge and sort of one of the you know, key problems that we see a lot of startups have is they can't quite sit in the shoes of their customer and really understand what it's like from a customer perspective. And many times it's not a particular you know, new piece of technology that a you know, company is developing is proud of, you know, on the other side of the fence as a customer, that may be fine. But if there are other things in terms of partners and additional software and integration required, if the company, if the startup doesn't have a way to address that, you know, it can be a real you know, drag and uh, force that's holding back uh, their growth in the market because companies will spend money you know, to solve problems. If you don't solve the problem, then you're offering a component and whether you know it or not, what you're expecting is that the company is going to be in the self-integration business and companies really don't like to do that. You know, they'll spend tons of money for solutions to problems, uh, but because they have their own internal you know, challenges, adding something new to their plate you know, to be able to integrate a startup's piece of technology with other things is something they're really not attracted to do. Mark, uh, are you advocating market research of some kind here? Or if, if I have an idea for a great new iPad product, let's say, uh, I mean, how do I go about contacting enough people to find out if it's viable because again i know how easy it is to fall in love with your own ideas and think wow this is the greatest thing since sliced bread and then you show it to someone or it, you you act on it and find out that nobody is really interested okay so there's a couple issues in, in that very simple question so uh to the opening market research yes that's uh, yeah, absolutely essential and really the discipline that uh, you know, I followed for you know, 12 or 15 years is you really need to go talk to the target market. You need to talk to buyers. 
and there's a number of ways you know, to talk to it. it should be you know talk in uh, you know sort of you know your proverbial air quotes because you need to understand what their pain is uh what uh, the manifestations and costs of the pain is to them or their organization. Uh, and then you need to you know, test to see if your idea is attractive as a potential solution. So there's a wide range of uh, techniques uh, to do this from one-on-one -on -one qualitative interviewing to you know, sort of, you know, high volume uh, you know, uh, surveys and uh, you know, other techniques. Um, they're like uh, tools in a surgeon's uh, you know, operating room. They have uh, different purposes at uh, different times, but really the key thing is that uh, you need to engage the target market. You talk to people uh, either directly or through uh, survey instruments to find out, are you presenting a problem? You know, sorry, are you presenting a solution that they know they have and that they are willing to spend money on? Again, you know, good common sense. Okay, so how about... Uh, how about price point? Because again, this is another issue. Depending on whether you're talking software or hardware, you're going to have a lot of costs. Plus, you have the cost with the market research, with everything you've talked to, talk, talked about up to this point. But I can't always cover all my costs. I, I, I don't think in the first round or of of issuing the product. How do I decide what I should charge to try to make it worth my while? Make sure I don't sink myself, but also don't price myself out of whatever market I'm trying to create. So establishing price is probably the most critical decision that a company faces in terms of launching new products. And while it's very, very critical, the sort of you know attempt to try to talk with their customers invariably is not uh, the right uh, way to approach it. Uh, the reason for this is uh, companies and you know even individuals have learned that if they're talking to a vendor, they're ultimately negotiating and they're negotiating about price. So you need to find you know, other ways to be able to you know, uh, qualify what uh, you know what they're willing to pay for a particular solution for a particular problem is. You know some ways to do it are. Maybe there's comparable products on the market, so you can compare something with a similar feature set, and uh, you know it's reason that uh, if they're willing to pay you know X number of dollars for you know brand A, that you know if you're coming to the market, that uh, you know that is somewhere within your pricing universe. From you know more you know high high tech uh, sort of a statistics point of view, there's a set of well known uh, techniques uh, called uh, ACBC, Adaptive Choice Based Conjoint. The reason a lot of customer research on pricing goes wrong is they're constructed in the abstract where you know, people can ask, yes, I'd like a car that gets 100 miles per gallon, costs $5,000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The real market doesn't work that way. People have to make choices every single day. So the benefit of using sort of choice based uh, methods is you're approaching things where at least you're trying to get them to have some skin in the game where they're looking at a variety of options and selecting one that is uh, most uh, attractive to them. Plus, uh, at the back end, you know, some of these methods employ very sophisticated you know, stoch stochastic modeling and uh, you know, Bayesian analysis and all sorts of you know, other high-tech uh, math terms. And what you're able to do at uh, the end, if you've uh, designed uh, this the, the research project appropriately is you can construct a market simulator so you can trade off different uh, product features. Uh, say in the, in the case of Drobo, is it you know four or five or eight drives? Uh, is it uh, you know a Firewire or a Thunderbolt or an iSCSI type of uh, interface? And uh, from this, you can do market simulation and figure out what the you know idealized uh, market share is for you know, different product uh, configurations. Uh, these are techniques that are much more used in a traditional sort of uh, consumer Procter and Gamble type of marketing or political and uh, social uh, science research, uh, but they're starting to be used more and more in high tech. And uh, I've used them you know, very extensively uh, in what we've done at Drobo to really provide a way to dig in and understand you know, how uh, the market thinks and what the changes are. Because when you say the market, it's not this big homogeneous group. You get all sorts of little uh, different uh, preferences, different idiosyncrasies where you know, different type of users value different things for different reasons. And uh, really what you're trying to do 
you know, as a new company is you're trying to maximize, you know, a broad appeal of your product uh, to as big a market uh, as possible. And while at the same time, you don't want to go crazy by introducing too many features because that just uh, introduces risk and additional development time. And in startups, especially VC funded startups, you know, time is the enemy. You want to get something into market and get a revenue stream as quickly as possible and then improve it and get uh, new customers and continue to expand. Mark, I think you're talking about uh, organizations, when you start talking about uh, venture capital, you know, they, they're talking about some pretty serious products and some pretty serious needs. What's your reaction to all the folks who are trying to do things and, and are doing successful things on Kickstarter? Uh, they obviously have gone through maybe some of these steps. They certainly haven't gone through all of them just because of the nature of what they're trying to accomplish. Is, is that just one of those, I don't want to say get rich quick, that, that's, that denigrates it and I don't intend to do that. Um, but it, everything you just described, I mean, there's, there's a lot to that. There's a lot of time and, frankly, a lot of expense to, to accomplish all that. Uh, yes, there is. So one of the interesting things about Kickstarter is, um, based on some of the Kickstarter projects I'm familiar with, uh, people get to vote in the sense that uh, they get to place pre-orders for it. So that is, ultimately, that is uh, probably some of the best uh, market feedback, you know, that people are willing to, you know, belly up to the bar, you know, plunk down a certain amount of money for, you know, a particular type of new iPad case for one story I've heard or a different uh, software or different uh, photography uh, accessories. And again, these are something that can be very fine businesses uh, that may not need uh, the level of funding because one of the things about uh, venture capital is they have an opportunity cost. So uh, as a result, you know, they're focused on the investments of uh, millions of dollars, whereas it's possible, depending on the nature of the product, you to develop it for, you know, several tens of thousands, you know, or hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, something like that is probably a little too small for traditional venture capital interest, but can be something that can be a really fine business. <laughs> I, again, you know, I, I don't want to sound like we're, we're sh shooting down people. Some of the things I've seen people come up with, uh, maybe they never get off the Kickstarter. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's one thing mm -hmm. we, we probably all, oh, you're right. We vote, uh, we pledge money or we give money. And if, it, if it, they don't make it, then I guess it never happens. Um, th there have been some really interesting things that have come out of that. And, you know, obviously the, the startup situation is legendary in Silicon Valley as the way so many of the companies we all know got started. Mm -hmm. So it's, it sounds like you have a pretty, a, a pretty rich field there in which to plant your boots and maybe try to grow some seeds. I certainly hope so. I mean, the Valley is uh, center to a large part of innovation. Um, but, you know, venture capital is only one way of financing a business. So, you know, I'd recommend to anybody who's listening who's thinking of starting uh, you know, a business that uh, it goes back uh, you know, to basics. It really goes back to, you know, what's the pain and the problem that you solve for a customer? Um, and then what does it take you know, to uh, solve it? And, you know, if it's uh, something simple, I mean, there are, you know, some very popular, very, you know, apps that uh, run on the iPad or iPhone uh, that can be developed, you know, by a, a small team of people where you don't need, you know, millions of dollars, you know, to develop uh, funding. And I think one of the things interesting about uh, the Apple software ecosystem is it provides a distribution channel. You know, people may gripe about uh, the 30% that Apple takes, but in many ways, I mean, that's absolutely ideal because you know, they're handling distribution, they're handling collections, you know, they're handling billing, they're offering a lot of value for you know, the software you know, entrepreneur, uh, so that you know he or she can focus on making the best product that they can. Uh, I'm familiar, uh, and unfortunately under NDA, with you know, one app company where. You know, it's uh, the number two app in its particular, uh, you know, segment on uh, the Mac App Store. And what they've done on this pricing is they've experimented with price. And, uh, you know, by watching uh, how buyers respond at different price points, they've they've been able to you know, optimize their price point. Uh, they started, uh, I believe, at $9.99, and uh, now their price is uh, $3.99, and the things are selling like hotcakes. So... You know, that's another example of you know, it's uh, it's a business. You know, this particular entrepreneur has uh, started, 
It's uh, you know something that is you know attractive. And will every app be able to succeed like that? No, of course not. Uh, you know this app you know particularly taps into you know a real set of problems that people have uh, using video and uh, iTunes libraries, and that's one of the reasons it's uh, succeeded so well. Is since we know you so well from your work with Drobo, mm-hmm. and that's been principally a hardware company, and now you're alluding to the fact that you're also working with software company. Are you focusing in one direction or another, or are they both pretty much the same kind of thing, just uh, slightly varying? Well, that's part of the reason why, uh, for me, working with startups is so exciting, is you get to work with companies in so many different areas. Uh, you know, I've got a broad background in terms of you know, hardware and software, uh, pretty much all over the map. So it's uh, tremendously exciting to work with uh, young companies and entrepreneurs in these different areas. And again, sort of the way I look at it is you bring a certain set of disciplines to help uh, you know companies rigorously evaluate uh, different market segments, uh, select customers, and then you know, plan how to enter and target the market. Those are a set of uh, universal uh, skills and requirements that uh, all sorts of companies have. And uh, again, the way you, you know, interact, it, uh, there's no one right, one size fits all answer. It really very much is driven by the nature of the business and uh, the desire of the founding team. Uh, you know, some people want uh, the appeal of venture capital. Others want to uh, have much higher control on how they run their business. And uh, you know, venture capital, uh, having a board, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on the company, just like being public puts a lot of pressure on management teams of public companies. Um, really, I think you know, for the key advice I would give is you know, for people who are thinking about uh, an entrepreneurial venture is really look in your mirror and figure out what you want to do because uh, venture capital is going to have you know very high expectations for you know growth and uh, return and that may not be right uh, for the founding team you know something smaller you know where it is uh, maybe not growing as quickly um, is uh, much more you know, appealing Mark, how much are you going to be involved uh, with the Mac community? I've, again, I, I'm extrapolating from your comment that if you're if you're working with anybody in the Mac space, in the Mac app space, or the iPhone or iPad app space, that you're going to be around. Uh, any particular bent toward Mac and Apple-oriented products, or is it just wide open in the tech field for you? Right now, it's wide open. Uh, I'm working you know, oddly in. Uh in addition to you know, some of the app developers, uh, potential one one client that we're talking about that may have a hardware device, uh, although that uh, is subject to all sorts of uh, to be determines, uh, as well as you know, I'm work, going to be continue to work with some of the creative uh, pros and uh, some of the wor- video workflow and video storage issues. Great, great. So and and, I'll, and I'm going to one of the parties at. Uh, WWDC in a couple of weeks, so uh, you know I'll be up and I'll be around. <laughs> I'm not disappearing. Well, well, that kind of uh, takes me to the next question. If if there are developers out there, or people that have an idea, or maybe they're already hip deep in a startup and would like to consult with you, how do they go about contacting you? I know contacting you. I know your Twitter uh, handle doesn't change, but obviously we can't put the Drobo links any, any anymore to uh, to reach you. Okay, so uh, they can go to my website. It's marketsweetspot.com. Uh, it's marketsweet, S-W-E-E-T, spot.com, all, all one word. And uh, there, there's a number of web pages that talk about some of our services and uh, what we add. And uh, within the next uh, week or two, I'll be adding links to a blog where I'll be talking about uh, some of the you know, lessons and challenges for you know, different startups you know, and how they face uh, their go-to-market challenges and how they answer those questions. Great, great. Well, in case anybody is just new to the show, I'll obviously have links to to Mark's site uh, to follow him on Twitter in the in the show notes as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, Mark's success with Drobo I think speaks for itself. Uh, they have a great product, and and Mark was very instrumental I think in getting it to where it was, and in doing so, he became a very well established face in the Mac community. I'm really glad to hear that he's he's still going to be doing it even if he's just showing up at parties at WWDC. That's uh, something that's, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I missed uh, a lot of while having to work the show floor. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Now you can get to enjoy some of the uh, the benefits. 
Well, I have to tell you that uh, your departure from Drobo does not excuse you from Mac jury duty, so I hope to see you back there uh, again real soon, sharing your wisdom and, and opinions on what's going on in, in our, our favorite uh, computing company. Well, we'll have to watch out for that jury summons. Definitely, definitely. Folks, that's Mark Fuccio. He is now Market Sweet Spot, MarketSweetSpot.com. Got that right, Mark? Yes, you did. Okay, great. Uh, again, check the show notes, or if you can remember that and know how to spell it, just go, and uh, Mark can help you do what he did for Drobo. Mark, it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much for the time, and best of luck with the new venture. Thank you very much, Chuck. I look forward to talking to you again. Folks, Mac Voices TV and Mac Voices are the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. We've been talking to Mark Fuccio. Check the website to follow us on Twitter and find out everything else that the Mac Voices group is doing. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Mac Voices TV is part of the Mac Voices group and a member of Mac Level 10.